From Broadway to the West End, from Evita to Norma Desmond, Patti LuPone has created some of the most memorable characters on the musical stage. Hi, I'm Ernie Manoos. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Tony Award winning actress Patti LuPone. Can actors switch between mediums anymore? Um, uh, well, yes, they should be able to. I think they should be able to if they are trained actors. I personally resent, <laughs> oh my God, this is how we start the interview. I personally resent the film and TV actor coming to Broadway, messing with the economics of the stage actor, and bombing. Yeah. And bombing on Broadway because they don't have the chops, they don't have the technique. Stage acting is considerably different. The discipline is different than um, television and film acting, and, and you need you need to train for it, even if it's just going to the gym to work up some sort of stamina for eight shows a week. Um, and I think that if you're a trained stage actor, it is easy for, easier for you to adapt to television and film. It's a question of larger or smaller. Um, but I also think it's, it's not the way it used to be where everything was in one city. The way it is in London, for instance, you can go, you can be on stage at night and shoot something during the day at Pinewood or what's the other one, Twickenham or something like that. Um, here you have to, unless it's shooting in New York, you have to fly to Los Angeles. Give do up you, your life, basically. Do you ever feel pigeonholed? Do you still think no. people look at you and say, ah, she's Broadway? No. No. No, enough time has passed in my career, but there, I was never typecast anyway because I kept moving between a musical and a play or a, a TV movie and a musical and a play. And I remember, you know, at first my agents, this was a course after a video, went, well, you can't do any, you know, you can't. I went to the Guthrie to work with Liv Chule, the Guthrie in Minneapolis, which is regional theater, because he asked me to, because I've admired his work. And he asked me to play Rosalind in his internationally famous production of As You Like It. And I went, of course. I, this is how I was trained at Juilliard. Of course I'll go. And my agent said, you can't do that. You were Evita. And I went, yeah, but if I waited for another role like Evita, I'd still be waiting. Yeah. So I went off to do uh, regional theater and was ripped apart in the newspapers because Evita was doing regional theater. But it, So it took a while f for what my history was before Evita to catch up with the girl that played Evita. Right. In the, in the same sort of question, when you're doing a TV series, Life Goes On, did that then cost her? Now she's a TV actress, can she come back to the theater? No. I don't think that ever plays into can you come back to the theater because the bulk of my work has been on stage. Um, no, but there was an article in the New York Times about stage actors on TV and how they adjusted to the television medium. Um, I wasn't, um, I didn't like the hours on Life Goes On. It was 16 hours a day. Really? <laughs> thought, I mean, I'm getting, I'm just getting ill thinking of it. Yeah, between 14 and 16 hours a day. And you had no life. No life. And the hour longs are incredibly difficult. The easiest job in show business is situation comedy. It's a nine to five job. And I love the stage because at eight o'clock, you know, the curtain's going to go, the curtain's got to come down. It goes up at eight, it's got to come down two hours later at the maximum two hours. Well, not always, you know. Right. Let's say three hours later, the curtain's going to come down. You know what you're, you're planning your day to that, you know, for that eight o'clock curtain when it goes up, it's bound to come down. You never know when they're going to stop shooting. Yeah. You really don't know when they're going to pull the plug and say it's a wrap. It's just like very difficult. Take me all the way back then. Always wanted to do this? Nothing Always. Else? I was bit when I was four years old. I was, um, my dad was principal of the only elementary school in my hometown of Northport, Long Island. And he started this extracurricular activities program. And my mother enrolled me in dancing. And, and I was in a black capizio leotard, black capizio jazz skirt, black capizio tap shoes, tapping. Downstage right, which you will hear tomorrow night. Um, and I 
I looked out at the audience and went, hey, I can't get in trouble up here. They're smiling at me. But up to that point, <laughs> I'd gotten in a lot of trouble as a four-year-old. And I went, jeez, I can't get in trouble. I can do whatever I want, and they'll still smile at me. So while I was on stage, I fell in love with the audience and never looked back. A quote you made that your favorite audience is the one that's not asleep. <laughs> is that true? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you wonder why, and this is on Broadway, and I see this, I still see it. You wonder why they spend that money to go into a darkened theater to fall asleep. I mean, we're talking, we're talking in the hundreds of dollars for a nap. Um, I actually, as Maria Callas in, in Masterclass, could wake them up. But, because I, I, the fourth wall was broken, but in other plays you can't exactly wake them up. Yeah. Unless you just sort of talk louder, which is then you're breaking character. But I, I, mean, I got my eye on the audience and I'm in character, but I, I actually peek before I'm very unprofessional. and I don't think it's unprofessional. I want to see who the, the audience is before I play to them. If I'm going to command the stage, I want to see who I'm playing to while the lights are up. And, um, you know, they've had, they've had a dinner. They, they go into a darkened theater. I suppose I, I want to go to the theater. I don't want to fall asleep, but I think there's some people that probably want to go to the theater to fall asleep. I don't know. Is it different if you're doing a concert as opposed to a show? Do you find a different well, audience? Well, uh, I don't, I don't hear, I don't see people falling asleep in, in concerts as much as I do on the on the Broadway stage because I think a lot of times people come to hear a symphonic orchestra or a singer, whereas at the theater on Broadway, their wives are dragging them and it may f be an obligation. Okay, tonight's Tuesday night. It's Broadway tonight's Tuesday, Wednesday night is the ballet. Um, there isn't that kind of. Well, there. I haven't experienced it in a long time, but there used to be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday audience. Monday night, people ran from work with their bagged lunch. They'd eat it because they wanted to go to the theater. They wanted to see the new play. Tuesday, the same thing. Wednesday matinee, you'd get the bridge and tunnel crowd. Wednesday night, you'd get a little bit of the bridge and tunnel crowd, but you could, you know, still, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it was a bridge and tunnel crowd. People that, theater parties or people that felt an obligation to go to the theater, especially Saturday night. Yeah. It's like the worst night. Why Saturday night? State night, USA. Hey, I got tickets for the Evita. <laughs> you mentioned Evita. The fame that came, the success that came with that show, were you prepared for it? Is anyone ever prepared no, for it? No, um, what I wasn't prepared for was the difficulty of the role. And I don't, the fame was infamy. It was, no, um, I was, um, it wasn't a joyous experience. It was one of the most difficult life lessons that I had to learn um, because I couldn't handle the role. And I was put in a situation where I under truly understood the vulnerability of the singer because I could, p I could be perfectly fine, but the vocal cords said, you're not going on stage tonight. You may not go on stage all week long. Uh, I was not singing the role correctly. I was getting no help from the producers, the director, the writers, because they didn't know what to tell me. Um, and then I was thrown to the lions because it was a tremendous success. And it had this juggernaut of, of, of hype behind it. And then I was the unknown cast. Yeah. And um, I got a lot of bad press and had to figure out how to filter the bad press, go out on the stage, and not be afraid of the role while I was trying to figure out how to play the role and sing it. So every night I went out, crossed myself, and prayed to God that I could get by the first D in the first 10 minutes. It's just a series of D's, E's, and F's. And, um, I, and I was not happy in the role. I, I left the, the, the play after Mandy left, which broke my heart because he was my ballast. And I left it, and I said, but you have nothing to go. And I, went, I lost my sense of humor. I have got to get out of here. So it never got any better doing it? Got it got better in Australia. I left, and I got a, you know, I had learned this, the art of patience. I could not vocalize um, without turning every faucet in my apartment on so that I didn't have to hear the first couple of notes because it would inevitably be this ragged, hoarse, horrible sound. I, I would kick my, kickstart my voice. Um, I would have the answering machine on, the phones turned off, and the volume off, so I didn't hear who was calling me, so I didn't speak for like between 12 and 14 hours a day. I lived like a monk just to get through a performance 
six times a week for nine months. So now the show's over. I've left. Yahoo! <laughs> I'm, I'm free! <laughs> and I get a telephone call, and I picked it up on the first ring. And it was Robert Stigwood said, do you want, saying, do you want to go to Australia? And I went, you know, nobody's ever going to ask me to go to Australia and work again. And I went, yes, I'll go. And that was when I found the joy in the role. I was in love. And I got the reviews I thought I should have gotten for the part. And I could sing it. After nine, ten months, I could finally sing it. So that each night I came off the stage, I went, I'm okay. I can go have a drink. Maybe two. <laughs> you know? And so, and, and I only played it for three months. And, but I, at one point, during a Vita in San Francisco, after I blew the opening night yet again and got terrible notices. I was having a staring, uh, they rented me this specific mansion in Pacific Heights. And it was infested with mice. <laughs> so it's not bad enough that I can't play the role, but I turn off the lights and put, put my head on the pillow, and they dive into the rat poison in the master bedroom. And it was like, and then one night I came home and I saw a mouse in the kitchen floor. And I had a 45-minute conversation with a friend of mine in New York, and the mouse was still there. And I got down on the floor and actually looked the my, mouse in the eyes. And I went, oh, he's dying. I went, I'm sorry. I, it's, I don't live here. I didn't do it. And he lunged at me. You, you. And I went, I, I broke. I went, this is insane. This is absurd. And it sort of was the turning point for me in Evita where I wasn't, like, so depressed. And I just had to laugh. I had to laugh at the whole thing. And it turned around and I started to relax into the role. I had a chorus, David Vosberg, somebody in the chorus, teach me how to sing the role every night. We worked on the show an hour and a half before I sang two hours of a show. I'd get the head, the tail would fall off. I'd get the head and the tail and a, a leg and another leg would fall off. So all through the 16 weeks on the road, he worked with me every day in my dressing room. Wow. It was, it was something that teaches you to be strong, but I don't know why. Yeah. I knew I was strong. It just made me stronger, and I don't know why, because I've never had a role like that since. <laughs> I don't know what it made me strong for. Childbirth? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I know. What did you think when you saw the film? I didn't see the film, and I'll tell you why. I'm, I think that they changed the keys. And it's like an opera. You can't like make Mimi a mezzo-soprano. It changes the whole tenor of the piece. And I did see a couple of numbers when the tempos were deadly, and I went, this isn't the Evita that had the audiences wrapped in the Broadway theater. Yeah. This is something else. There's no need to see it. And it wasn't that I was you know, envious of Madonna. I was already too old to play the part. As a matter of fact, before Madonna got the role, Hollywood Pictures was, 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 was going to do it, and I was uh, offered the role of Evita's mother. <laughs> she really brightened up your out of town and game it. Cut, that's a wrap on Patty. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's all there was. <laughs> and it went, Evita's mother, I don't think so. Um, but that was about a good 10 years before Adonna, Madonna, Adonna, Madonna played Evita. Um, it didn't look as though it rose to the occasion of what Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Hal Prince had created. Yeah. It looked like it didn't, it wasn't as good as Chicago. It didn't have that Broadway gut. In Evita, you play a living person, or one that had been alive. In LBJ, once again, you do somebody who's been alive. A lot of talk has been going on right now about trying to tell the story of people, historical stories, and yet be accurate to it. But you can't necessarily be 100% accurate when you're putting a life story down into two or four hours. What do you think about all of that? Well, what are, you, what are you talking about? You mean, I mean, even the as recently as the, in, in a script? Well, even as recently as the Reagan. Oh, that series. I think is ridiculous. I'm sorry. That is, cens- that is total censorship. That is somebody going, you know, you're going to have this studio taken away from me if you put that on. I am appalled at that. So what? They're public figures. Excuse me. If they chose not to be in the public light, he wouldn't have been president. He wouldn't have been an actress. She, would, she wouldn't have been an actress. He wouldn't have been an actress. I'm sorry. That pisses me off. What do I think? It's a play. It's a movie. I mean, somebody wrote something. 
Maria, I did Maria Callas. I did what was, you know, based on the, the master classes at the Juilliard School. I listened to the master classes. I was at school. We never went. Well, some, some of the kids in school did. The actors were not encouraged necessarily to go to these. And I was too busy partying, whatever, you know, anything <laughs> other than go and listen to an opera singer, even though she, I knew who she was and the tremendous excitement in the building. I have more important things to do <laughs> at 20 years old. Um, <laughs> But they are not, this was not Maria Callas, uh, LBJ. They tried to follow it as accurately as possible, but there is still theatrical license. And Judy Davis is a brilliant actress. And I think, what's his name, James Brolin. I mean, I haven't seen that much of his work, but I'm, she, that's the woman I thought should have played Evita. Judy Davis. Mm-hmm. Roland Marnie Nixon, who I understand is still alive. Have her sing the role. <laughs> and then you've got some guts in that part. I mean, you've got a real actress in the part. And, you know, like an incredible voice that could hit those notes. But I think that's outrageous that they, yeah. they pulled it. It looks like. Okay, let me take you back to the stage then. Les Miserables. Mm-hmm. What disappointed me about it was so little of you in there. Oh, in the role of Fantine? Yes. It's a wonderful role. Mm-hmm. But I was expecting after the success of the Vita, we would see a big patty role again. Why did you choose to take that role? Oh, it's incredible. Well, like I said, now, if I waited, I'd still be waiting for a role like Evita. There isn't a role like Evita. Yeah. There isn't. There was nobody like Evita. What are they going to, you know, they're... Um, I was going to London to do The Cradle of Rock, and Cameron McIntosh, whom I had worked for in Oliver, saw my picture in an English newspaper, and they had could not cast Fantine. And so he came to my apartment and he played me two bars. He said, he said would you be interested? And I happen to love London. And he said, um, he played two, two to four bars. And I heard, this is the French production too. This was not even ours. And I went, is it? And the idea of working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, being the first American to work with the Royal Shakespeare Company, in the Royal Shakespeare Company's home, London home, the Barbican Theatre, to be in London for a year. But see, I don't choose a part by the size. I don't even think I heard Fontaine's song. Oh, excuse me, I did hear Fontaine's song. It was the idea of that memory, that experience, working with Alan Armstrong and working with Roger Allen and working with RSC actors. And I went and had the time of my life and chose in the second week not to do it in, in New York. And I knew I was going to get asked to do it in New York. And I went to Cameron. I was in my barricade uniform. <laughs> and I went, to, it was, I went to the stage door, and there was Cameron. I said, Cameron, I can't do this in New York. He said, I know the part's too small. I went, no. I said, it's, and he, he, I knew he wouldn't get it. I said, this is a perfect production. It was a perfect production. It was a perfect cast in the perfect environment in a perfect play. The only thing a stage actor has are their performances and the memory of them. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to compromise this event in my life. It was the hardest decision that I made. Um, I was offered the role. I said no. My husband and I are flying home from England and somebody tapped me on the shoulder as we're descending. And he said, we're going to miss you tonight. I'm Colin Wilkinson's agent. Les Mis is opening. And I burst into tears. And I cried. You know, I saw the reviews. I cried. I went, what did I do? What did I do? Then I saw John Caird. He said, let's go pick up, you know, Francis Raphael. I said, okay. I hadn't seen it. And we went, second acted it, and I went, that's why I turned it down. What I saw was a copy of the British cast. Yeah. It's what they do now. They don't let you, the new cast, they, they don't want to mess with a hit. They gave them a CD. So you, 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 do, you imitate, your Tenardier has got to be like Alan Armstrong. you got to sound like that. You gotta, and so what I saw was a, a cast that was not unique, and it would have been a step down, and that's when I went, you made the right decision. Because I still have the memory of the cast that I was a part of. Yeah. That's very important for my, I don't know what, my, I don't know what, my life, my, the honor in my life, the, the integrity in my, my 
the choices that I make? I don't know. Because it's a cheap world. It's a cheap business. It's a cheap and vulgar business. Unless I make it different. Unless the, the performer makes it the, different. Yeah. You talk about larger-than-life characters. And I know we're skipping over things as we go along, but otherwise we'd never have time to fill it all in. Sunset Boulevard. Right. Oh. What a huge character. <gasps> yeah, I know. What a, <laughs> talk about a devastating experience. Ah, uh, yeah. What do you want to know? <laughs> what do you want to tell me about it? Well, it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. And it was, um, mine was the most public, but everybody went through it. You know, down to the firemen that sleep in the theaters at night. Kevin Anderson and I delivered the show that was written under the direction of Trevor Nunn. I, same thing, Kevin was fired too. I, I, Kevin left the show in January and I went, where are you going? Because it was a, really, it was a battlefield. He said, I said, why are you leaving? He said, because I can. And I went, oh. So Kevin went away, came back, we went out to dinner, and I said, they had announced Glenn Close. And of course, all the while in America, I'm being fired, all the while in London, my, my name is not in the newspaper at all, because I'm turning in a performance every night. Right. There's no problem in London, it's all germinating from the States. And of course, you really useless going, no, no, we don't know where this is coming from. I said, well, you better stop it. You know, you gotta, we don't know how. Well, a lot of people said they were, whatever. It's a long and complicated yeah. story. Um, but Kevin, I said, are you going to do it, Kevin? He said, I don't know whether I am. And I, in my heart of hearts, knew that he had been fired because when they announced Glenn Close, they would have said Kevin Anderson would have been reprising his role. They, and they didn't. He didn't find out he was fired. They'd never told him. They never told him he would not be reprising his role. It was that kind of treatment right down the line. Yeah. In the negotiations for me, started I. And then the show... Whatever problems the show had could have been fixed had we had a better director and a better, well, a composer who was not so obsessed with having the largest hit of his you know, career. And you can't collaborate. You can't make... And Trevor's a wonderful director. Don't get me wrong. I love working with Trevor. But I don't find the English the answer to Broadway musicals. I think they're the answer to Shakespeare and Restoration. But I do not find them to be the answer. They're laborious at best. They do not know how to disguise any flaw. They just want to expose them to the world. And Broadway musicals, by their very nature, are flawed. Yeah. Joke, joke, song. Or, you know, <laughs> part of a scene or, you know, maybe a scene or a song. Yeah. You know, but they want to, like, investigate them and, like, invest them with I don't know what. So, and the, I was invited to the closing night. It was rehearsing master class. And... I didn't know it was going to go. And I got a message from my stage manager, from my old stage management, saying, we want you to come to closing night. And I went, oh, my God. I went home to my husband in London. And I said, Matt, I got a phone call. They want me to go to the close. They want to do. He said, yeah, let's go. And I went, holy <laughs> crap. Are you got to be kidding. I was, all right, let's go. What have I got to lose? So I walked right into Anthony Powell, John Kerr, Trevor, none. Well, and no, John Napier. Anthony Powell, the creative staff, they, were sh they turned ashen when they saw me. <laughs> Petula Clark was finishing out the run. We took our seats. I ended the first act. I got up and I went to the musical director. Were we this boring? Uh -huh. It was not a good show, but it was my fault. You bought a pool with your settlement? Is that oh, honey, right? I got a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jump ahead now, talking once again. A lot of these roles you create. You stepped in, or didn't step in, you, you, re, you brought back, remounted, restaged Sweeney Todd. Oh, wow. Everyone's going to look at that and say, Angela Lansbury did it. There's no way anyone else can do it. You did. What did you do that you were able to make that character so your own? And I am a huge fan of Angela Lansbury. I think, first of all, you go into it, one, an actor should, I, go into it without the fear of the other actor's performance. And I'm only responsible for the text. I'm only responsible for what's written. And I did not see her the way Angela did. Yeah. I saw her as something else and had a director who didn't go, no, 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 no. <laughs> he just didn't do anything. I work with this guy, Lonnie Price, who does these. Um, we're doing another one. We're doing 
what we've done. Wells Kaufman is responsible for these. When he was an artistic administrator at the New York Phil and he moved to the Chicago Symphony, we've done two others. We just did Passion. Audra McDonald played Clara. I played Fosca. We did a little night music the year before. And Link, Inc., I believe, is going to now bring Passion the same way the Phil did. I don't know if we're doing it with the New York Phil. I'm not sure. But we're going to continue this, and they're going to be filmed. And it's also in concert version. But it's, it might as well be staged. I mean, it might as well, you might as well. It, it, the only thing that's missing is that the orchestra's not in the pit. That's the only thing that's missing. We will continue to do these. And I just think that if you don't have the fear, but go in there with Lonnie Price as the director, you can't lose. Yeah. I didn't see it that way. <laughs> okay, favorite thing you stole costume-wise? Oh, for people who don't know, you love to take something from every you show. You have to, yeah. yeah. I'm selling it all on eBay now because I've got a monstrous load of stuff. My, <laughs> most, favorite, my most favorite thing, let me turn the right, um, Adelaide, Adelaide Lorino, God rest her soul, she just passed, was a legendary wardrobe supervisor on Broadway. And she came to me while the show was going on. And I was about to make an entrance and she had a black velvet um, jewelry tray, and on there were these, this choker and these earrings and this braces. She was leading them in front of her, and she went, "These were Ethel Merman's, Ethel Merman's from Call Me Madam." <laughs> and I went, oh, "Toledo!" So I wore them in the charity concert. When I left the show, everybody looked the other way, and I took them <laughs> because nobody will remember. They would have gotten broken and thrown out. I have them out. They'll go into a museum. They, we don't have that same tradition. I went, the first time I went to California to do a Hollywood movie, I was at Western Costumes, and I put, I swore I put on June Allison's dress. I swore it was June Allison's dress. <laughs> and there was no label in the back of it. They used to put labels in. I had on Julie Christie's corset from Uncle Vanya when I did The School for Scandal. I went, holy, it carries a tradition you know, it carries, it's the same thing I talked about earlier. You know, I don't know what the correct word is. It gives dignity, a, a kind of integrity, a kind of, an, you know, to, to know that you're, you're in part of a tradition. Those were Ethel Merman's. Yeah. Aurora Stones. And I, the guy, Donald Standen, who did a lot of her jewelry, knew the designer. He said, you hold on to those, Patty. Because they get lost. So that was my favorite thing that I took. Yeah. Well... We are out of time, but I want to thank you for taking us down. That went quick, huh? I know. I talk of a blue streak, don't I? <laughs> and there's so much more. Thank you so much for oh, doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Are you kidding? My pleasure. Patty Lupone. What can I steal from this room? <laughs> <laughs>transcript call 866-652-3378 or send six dollars and 95 cents to the address on your screen please include the name of the guest